Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, I'm not going to tell you what this chart is to start off with, but you can see just by looking at the chart here with the primary trend channel, we're breaking out of it a little bit, uh, starting to break down, but the primary trend here is clearly up. This is clearly a bull market. Why is that so important? Well, because this is gold in the Japanese yen. Now, a lot of people think that gold is in a bear market right now. It's not in a bear market. It is in a correction in the US dollar, but it is still in a bull market. And what this chart tells you is that rather than telling you something specifically about Japan or about the yen, more importantly what this chart tells you is that if you live in a country with a worthless spendthrift government, gold is your friend. And uh, that's very important with what we're going to be looking at here when we're talking about capital controls. Now, before we start to dig into that, I wanted to give a shout out here to NetZ and Ranger for pointing out that uh, the bullion mintages have come out. Now, these aren't final mintage numbers, but you can see here that Ranger observes that the half ounce goat came in at 112,000. So if we go to this link here, you can go down to Australian Lunar Silver Bullion Series 2, 2008 to 2015. And you can see here the first, uh, I've gone over this series before and the trends in it. We know that uh, the, the one ounce is always sold out but uh, you can see here that came in with the goat uh, down here at the very bottom. Uh, of course, it sold out at the one ounce. That's always the case. And we watched the one ounce very carefully. We're going to be watching the one ounce on that monkey especially carefully. But uh, we did the same thing we've done for the past number of years with the Lunar Series because the one ounce was overpriced. Now, it did come down to about 28 bucks, but remember... That was like 10 bucks above spot. I've only uh, the lowest I've ever seen that coin was 26. So again, we decided to accumulate the half ounce and the two ounce, and I think that was a very good decision. Now I was delighted with the coins we got from Gainesville. We were able to buy half ounce lunar goats for less than ten dollars. They were nine dollars and something cents. So that's twenty dollars an ounce for those lunar goats. I think between us and the members, we probably have at least 5% and maybe even 10% of this issue in the half ounce. Also note that the two ounce is a very low number at 40,000. Now these are not final figures, but I suspect these will be very close to the final figures. So 40,000 coming in on that two ounce, and you can see by comparison, the, the half ounce on the horse series was 250,000. And the two ounce was 112,000. Um, back at the year of the snake, which wasn't quite as popular, you can see 56,000, but 160,000 on the on the uh, half ounce. So I think this half ounce goat is going to be a big winner. Uh, if we go all the way back to the half ounce mouse, which was the first year of that, you can see that that half ounce mouse was all the way down here around 17,000. That's an extremely rare issue. Same thing with the half ounce ox. But then again, when you calculate in the number of people that have come into the game since then, uh, these are still going to be very, very rare. So uh, great work, guys. Thanks for pointing that out. It's going to be interesting. We're going to be keeping an eye on that monkey going forward. So I want to come back to the topic about capital controls and these governments uh, destroying their currencies and why you have to protect yourself with gold. Now, we'll start out with this article from Doug Casey on Zero Hedge. And this is kind of interesting, so we'll read this whole thing. This is called Crossing Borders with Gold and Silver Coins, A Glimpse of Things to Come. Now, if you remember, it's been a long time since I pointed it out, but I did point out that I believe that uh, the 911 reaction with the airports and all the stuff like that, with the TSA and stuff, has nothing to do with terrorism or terrorists. It has to do with capital controls. And I, I think that when we read this Doug Casey article, we're going to see that's what's coming down the pike. 
these governments want to protect themselves from their own citizens. And one of the big things that citizens of countries can do is remove the wealth from the country. And that's, a, that's voting with your feet. And that's a very important part of democracy you can see in Venezuela. They're trying to squelch that because when a government is morally and fiscally bankrupt, uh, people who have good sense leave and they leave with their wealth. So let's take a look at this here. It's well known that you have to make a declaration if you physically transport $10,000 or more in cash or monetary instruments in or out of the U.S. or almost any other country. Governments collude on these things, often informally. Gold has always been in something of a twilight zone in that regard. It's no longer officially considered money, so it's usually regarded as just a commodity like copper, lead, or zinc for these purposes. The one ounce Canadian maple leaf and U.S. Eagle both say they're worth $50 of currency. Uh, that would be the gold. But I've recently had some disturbing experiences crossing borders with coins. Of course, crossing any national border is potentially disturbing at any time. You might find yourself interrogated, strip searched, or detained for any reason or no reason. But I suspect what happened to me in three of the last four borders I crossed could be a straw in the wind. I've gradually accumulated about a dozen one ounce silver rounds in my briefcase. Some souvenirs issued by mining companies plus others from Canada, Australia, China, and the US. But when I left Chile a couple of months ago, the person monitoring the x-ray machine stopped me and insisted I take them out and show them to her. This has never happened before but I wrote it off to chance. Then when I was leaving Argentina a few weeks later, the same thing happened. What was really unusual was that the inspector looked at them, took them back to his supervisor, and then asked if I had any gold coins. I didn't. He smiled and I went on. What really got my attention was a few weeks later when I was leaving Mauritania, one of the world's most more backward countries. Here I was also questioned about silver coins. A supervisor was again called over and asked me whether I had any gold coins. Clearly, something was up. I haven't seen any official statements about the movement of gold coins, but it seems probable that governments are spreading word to their minions. After all, $10,000 in $100 bills is a stack about an inch high. It's hard to hide and clearly a lot of money, but even at current depressed prices, $10,000 is only nine maple leaves, a much smaller volume. Additionally, the coins are immune to currency sniffing dogs, are much less likely to be counterfeit, and don't have serial numbers. And if they're set aside for a few years, they won't be damaged by water, fire, insects, currency inflation, or the complete replacement of a currency. Gold coins are in many ways an excellent way to subvert capital controls. And I think they'll become much more popular in that role. That's because all over the world, paper cash is disappearing. People are moving away from paper cash. That's partially because there are fewer and fewer bank branches where you can cash a check and ATM machines are costly to use. And partially because everybody has a cell phone and they're starting to use them for even trivial purchases like a cup of coffee. Governments are encouraging this because if all purchases, sales, and payments are made electronically, they'll know exactly what you're doing with your money. From their point of view, the elimination of cash will have several major benefits. It decreases the opportunity for tax evasion. It decreases the possibilities of money laundering. It eliminates the expense of printing currency. It obviates counterfeiting, and it gives the state instant access to all and any of an individual's cash. From an individual's point of view, however, the safety and freedom offered by a stack of paper cash will disappear. Much of the safety and freedom offered by foreign banks and brokerage accounts has already disappeared. Few people seem to be aware of the fact that not so long ago, there was no limit to the amount of cash you could transfer in or out of the U.S. without reporting, or that you didn't have to report the existence of offshore bank or brokerage accounts, although you did have, you did have to report taxable income from them. That changed in 1970, first with the passage of USC 3156, and then the perversely named Bank Secrecy Act. The 1986 Tax Reform Act made it highly inconvenient and largely uneconomic to invest in passive foreign investment companies, PFICs. In 2010, the Foreign 
Account Tax Compliance Act, FATCA, required every foreign financial institution in the world to report info on U.S. persons to the U.S. government. The enormous regulatory burdens and potential penalties it imposes now make it very hard to find a foreign institution that will even open an account for an American. These are all de facto capital controls. In the U.S., banks are starting to notify customers that they're not responsible for the storage of cash or gold in their safe deposit boxes. When I was in New Zealand a couple of months ago, I was taken aback to see that the suburban branch of a major bank was closing down its substantial safe deposit box department. When I inquired why the manager only knew that it was a new policy and if I wanted a box, I'd have to go to the main branch. This seems to be another worldwide trend. If there isn't a safe place to store paper cash or gold, then people will be less likely to possess them. But it's getting worse. Over the last couple of years, there have been efforts to pass a bill that would allow the U.S. to deny issuance or cancel the passport of anyone who is simply accused of owing $50,000 or more in taxes. I expect this will become law at some point after all it clearly states on your passport that it's the government's property and it must be turned in upon request people are actually the most valuable form of capital immigration has always been nearly impossible from authoritarian regimes so what's next i expect As the subtle war on both cash and the transfer of capital across borders gains momentum, that gold coins are going to become the next focus of attention. So I suggest that you act now and beat the last minute rush. Have a meaningful percentage of your net worth in gold coins. Have a significant number of those coins stored outside the country of your citizenship. Concentrate your future purchase in small coins that are indistinguishable from loose change. Now that's a very good and interesting observation there. Things like British sovereigns, 0.23 ounces of gold and their continental equivalents, French, Swiss, German, Danish, Russian pieces of generally 0.18 ounces of gold. Not only is it cheap now, but all of these are currently at only a few percent above melt. Happily, they have collectible value, and they resemble common pocket change to an x-ray machine. Also do this. Put a bunch of silver eagles in your briefcase the next time you travel internationally, and let us know if your experiences resemble our own. So very, very interesting there from Doug Casey, and uh, he's been watching this trend for quite some time. We know what they're up to, and what they're up to is capital controls. Now, I want to segue into a GDP story, and the reason why is because uh, I believe they're manipulating GDP figures, and they're basically fake. So I want to get into that story by looking at this other story on Zero Hedge, just to show you what stood out here when I was reading this. This is called Visualizing China's Mind-Boggling Consumption of the World's Raw Materials. Over the last 20 years, the world economy has relied on the Chinese economic growth engine more than it would like to admit. The 1.4 billion people living in the world's most populous country account for 13% of global GDP. Now I want you to think about that. Keep that figure in mind. Which is significant no matter how it is interpreted. However, in the commodity sector, China has another magnitude of importance. The fact is that China consumes mind-bending amounts of materials, energy, and food. That's why the prospect of slowing Chinese growth is likely to continue as a source of nightmares for investors focused on the commodity sector. The country consumes a big portion of the world's materials used in infrastructure. It consumes 54% of aluminum, 48% of copper, 50% of nickel, 45% of all steel, and 60% of concrete. In fact, the country has consumed more concrete in the last three years than the United States did in all of the 20th century. Think about that. China has consumed more concrete in the last three years than the United States did in the 20th century. China is also prolific in accumulating precious metals. The country buys or mines 23% of all gold and 15% of the world's silver supply. And then it goes into food. So think about these commodities here. You've got concrete, 60% of the concrete, 54% of the aluminum, 50% of the nickel, 
48% of the copper, 46% of all the steel, 49% of the coal, 13% of the uranium, 12% of the oil. Now this is what ought to give you a clue here. The percentage of oil, uh, okay, their population is 20%. Their GDP is 13%. Now, the first thing that stood out to me is what does all this stuff go into? Concrete, aluminum, nickel, copper, steel. Well, it goes into building infrastructure, but it also goes into exports. It goes into manufacturing. So are we to really believe that a country that consumes half of all of these things only has 13% of the world's GDP? I don't think so. I think they're lying about GDP. Now, let me take you over to one of my favorite sites, and that's Trading Economics. Uh, this is a fantastic site. You could literally spend days here. Uh, you can go up to these indicators and click on them, and then you'll get lists by countries. Uh, you can also go into the individual country and look at any indicator you want. Now, we're in the United States economic indicators right now, and let's look at GDP. Now, GDP used to be called GNP, or Gross National Product, but economists change that, and I think the saying applies here that uh, statistics don't lie, or uh, figures don't lie, but liars figure. Uh, we've got a lot of liars figuring here. So what I want you to notice here when we do this breakdown is the breakdown into GDP categories. In the United States, we have these GDP breakdowns. GDP from agriculture, from construction, from manufacturing, from mining, from public administration, from services, from transport, and from utilities. Now, what I would consider to be GDP primarily would be GDP from manufacturing, and then secondarily would be construction, mining, and agriculture. These four would be GDP for me. I don't consider services to be GDP. I don't consider a uh, increase in the number of doctors in a hospital an increase in, to GDP. Uh, that's not producing wealth for the country. It's actually taking away wealth from the country. Transport. Uh, that's kind of hit or miss. So these four are going to be core for me, of course. So we want to look at some of these. Let's look at construction. Still below the 2008 peak. Manufacturing uh, is has climbed, uh, is starting to flatline. Mining is barely uh, got past the last peak and is now collapsing. But let's look at some of these others. GDP from public administration. Uh, what's that? Government? Probably. Uh, GDP from services. Through the roof. And so those are going to be two that I consider bogus GDP. We already know they're lying about GDP. Now let's go over and look at China. The first thing you want to notice here is they don't have those categories. They just have GDP per capita and GDP per capita PPP and uh, GDP. That's all they have. Now you say, well, that might be because China is backwards and that's why they don't have that. Let's look at Japan. They're not backward. They don't have it either. Why is that? Well, it's because we're comparing apples and oranges. It's because they're lying. Now, how does this get back to our main topic, which is capital controls? The way that it gets back is this. They can lie about GDP, but they cannot lie about uh, capital controls and wealth fleeing the country. Uh, Nick the bus driver Maduro in Venezuela can say that their wealth is anything he wants to say that it is. But the reality is the people don't have enough to eat and they don't even have toilet paper and they can't even import the necessary goods. That's the reality. The rest of it is just rhetoric. The United States is now going on the course of rhetoric. But the truth of that uh, is always shown by the people fleeing the country with their wealth. So that's why I believe that the United States has instituted the mechanisms of capital controls. We don't have capital controls yet, but we have a mild form of capital controls beginning. People are going to be wanting to get their money out of the country uh, as the country becomes to uh, 
resemble Venezuela more and more. And they're probably going to want to get their money either east to Asia or south into South America. Uh, that's one thing that governments can't fight. Now, uh, if you remember back when India tried to institute uh, restrictions on gold, uh, they had to give up because what happened was the gold smuggling became such a problem that uh, all their resources were directed towards that and the amount of gold coming into the country actually increased. They finally gave up on that and actually elected a gold-friendly uh, politician in the last election. So there are some things governments can't fight, but they will try to fight it. And these people in the United States, these neocons or whatever you want to call these people that instituted the 911 and all of the controls they brought into place with the, the Patri so-called Patriot Act and all these controls they want over the people, these people aren't going to go away quietly. They want to control everything. And they are going to institute strict capital controls. And as Doug Casey said, ultimately, the ultimate controls is immigration controls. We now have Donald Trump. Uh, his main theme that he has out there that he's running on is this immigration thing. And I've said for the longest time, just like I've said, that uh, the TSA is not about terrorists. It's about capital controls. Uh, I would say that this issue about immigration... It's not about foreigners coming in. It's about you getting out. And we'll talk to you next time.